The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Welcome to the Center for Educational Media and Professional Development in the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University. We're here today with the ELL Collaborative, which is a professional develop, development initiative here at MTSU that supports the work of teachers who work with English learners. Today, we are happy to have two teachers today, Ms. Isomari Pozo and Ms. Jessica Uverard. They work together at Scales Elementary. They co-teach. In the ELL Collaborative, you have requested a number of times to have some sessions on co-teaching and collaboration between gen ed teachers and ESL teachers. And so we have presentation today, including classroom video that was uh, produced by the Center for Educational Media and Professional Development. So I'm happy to introduce Ms. Pozo and Ms. Uverard. So my name is Ms. Pozo, Isol Mari Pozo. I am from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico. A little bit shaken, but we're good. Um, I was raised in various states in the US, so I myself an e am an ESL student. My whole life, pretty much, I still get, you know, nervous sometimes, and my brain will go. Literally, it's like I could see a, a ping pong ball going from Spanish, English, Spanish, <laughs> trying to find a word, you know. Um, I graduated from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico with uh, a bachelor's degree in ESL as a second language. There is such a thing uh, back home, and then I did a master's degree at Texas A&M um, in 2011. I've been teaching for 19 years. Uh, 11 of which were uh, as a bilingual educator in Texas and then ESL here in Tennessee. So that's a whole lot of ESL. <laughs> and my partner here. Hello. Um, my name is Jessica Everard. I am not as accomplished as Ms. Bozo. Um, but I actually graduated here from MTSU. Um, I just graduated a year ago, so I have just only taught one year, um, for one complete year in fourth grade. And so right now I'm currently in my second year of teaching. Um, and so Ms. Pozo is the one who pushes into my classroom. And last year I only had one ELL student, and then this year I have three monitor students, one ELL student, and then three more that push in from other fourth grade classrooms. Um, and so that is why she is able to push into my classroom. So we have a total of seven students that um, we're incorporating into the collaboration. We, we service through this model. So um, when at the end of last year, I kind of, you know, trying to plan ahead, I kind of saw we had a very large third grade group and I knew they were moving up to fourth grade. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect opportunity for some co-teaching and some collaboration. So then I kind of waited at the beginning of the year to see where they would fall and she ended up having the most. So I said, she won. <laughs> so I went up to her at the beginning of the year and I said, You're gonna, you have three monitor students, two T1s and one T2. And there's going to be some level one uh, active ELs. Um, and later on in the year, another brand new newcomer from Puerto Rico joined the group. So she has a wide gamut of ELL kiddos in her classroom. And so what are some of these benefits of co-teaching? Um, support student engagement, time and participation, instructional options for learning, opportunity for inclusive instructional styles, and the collaboration between all educators working with the EL students. I added this information here. There's a podcast from the authors of this book. This is the resource that we've been using. The podcast is pretty long, but it's very informative and very interesting what they talk about. Um, of how this can occur. So 
co-teaching, I'm not here to say, you know, this is for everybody, you gotta try it, you gotta go do it. No, this, th there's certain things that have to be in place for it to work successfully. And so, I call them essential elements for success. First and foremost, we had to have our admin support. You know, when I went up to her, um, I was like, I really wanna try this. Would you be okay, you know, with some flexibility in our schedule? And she said, as long as the schedule allows, go for it. Um, flexible scheduling is up there. Um, using our resources, I too am a sci up train the trainers, so I've been using all of that knowledge that I have. Uh, Ms. Uvarard and I have been trying to study through the book and learn some more from, from in here, and we have used some of the tools. There's some tools for collaboration. I didn't think I could copy them for copyright issues, but they're all in there and we've used them. Uh, available planning time is a big one. I know that at the previous collaborative, planning time was a big question. How do you do that? Well, we're gonna walk you through the process of how Ms. Uvarard and I are able to accomplish it. Uh, building relationships, this is absolutely essential. You know, it's, it's a catalyst. You, we, I had to go in and talk to her in, in very subtle ways. Hey, I really want to try this with you. And at first, she was a little scared. <laughs> Let's be honest. But I told her, you know, I, I'm not here as a gotcha. I am not here as I'm going to evaluate you. I'm here to help you. I am here to be your resource, be your tool, and help you help these kids. And that's how we started to build that relationship. And I put willingness and mindset up there because you really gotta want to do it. You really gotta want to try it for it to actually work. If you already have it in your mind, oh, I can't do that, that's too hard, scheduling is a nightmare, guess what? You just put a bunch of barriers to yourself. So have a growth mindset, have a willing mindset, and you will find a way that where there's a will, there's a way. I believe in that. But this is the book, <laughs> and that's the instructional um, cycle. So there's collaborative planning, then we go to lesson delivery, then collaborative assessment of the student learning, and then reflection and action. You're going to see us go through the entire cycle. I'm going to briefly describe the models for you that the book talks about so that you will be able to identify some of these models in our lesson. You know, the best way to show these teachers how this works is to show them the whole process. What we do with the pre-planning, how we accomplish that, a full lesson, and then what happens afterwards. So we're gonna, you're gonna walk with us, you're gonna take imaginary trip, and we're gonna be in her classroom, and this is what you're going to see. So model one. Uh, one group, one leads, one teacher on purpose. So this is where she would be up front, and she's leading, and I am, helping with the classroom and, and being there, like immediate feedback for the kids. Module two, one group to teach the same content. Uh, at some point, both of us are in, the front of, in front of the classroom and we're both teaching the content. We kind of bounce ideas off each other. Model three, one group, one teaches, one assesses. Kind of a little similar to the first one where one of us will be walking around getting feedback, but at the same time, we are doing checking for understanding as we're going around. Module four, two groups, two teach the same content. Two heterogeneous groups, ELs are mixed in, two identical classes, similar um, small classes. So she could be up front with directing the group and I could be in the back with my ELs. Model five, two groups, one pre-teaches, one teaches alternative content. This, is, this one uh, lends itself to being able to differentiate more on the lesson. Maybe my newcomer who just came here, I'll have a lot of visuals for him and things like that. Model six, two groups, one reteaches, one teaches alternative content. The difference is one was pre-teaching stuff, this is reteaching. And model seven, multiple groups, teachers monitor and facilitate each other. Um, in the book for this one, they have like, it, the picture looks like kind of like centers, and that's how that one works. Now, you're not gonna see all seven models in one lesson, but you will see a mix. <laughs> so how does it work? You know, how do you provide these ELs with direct instruction? Remember, flexible scheduling. This year, it just worked out that I pull them out for my 60 minutes. This is where I build background. I teach vocabulary. I use it doing picture word induction model. I use drama-based techniques um, and strategies. And then I walk with them 
to her classroom, where I push in for another 60 minutes during her tier one time. And in that tier one time, part of it is writing and part of it is uh, science or social studies content, depending on what, where she's at at the moment in her scope and sequence. Once her students leave and they go for specials, her and I are able to have a common planning time, which is about 45 minutes. We don't always get to meet every single day because we do have PLC meetings we have to get to and sometimes other meetings get in the way of that. But when we're not able to debrief that way, we debrief through email um, and we keep the same email thread so we can kind of keep track of the conversation that we've been having that way. And that's been very useful because, you know, there are moments where like, oh, I forgot what I said. But when you document it that way through email, you can just go back and check. Uh, sometimes we use text messages or we call each other. And on occasions, we meet one day on the weekend as needed. Again, no, no one says that you have to go do that. It's not in your contract. I get it. We do it because we want to. We decide, hey, do you want to meet this weekend? And we do that. And it's not for five, six hours, but for a little bit until we hash out the, the next following week, and then we move from there. It doesn't happen all the time, but there has been occasions where we have done that. So building background knowledge before they go to the general classroom. Like I said before, this is where I keep them for their uh, direct instruction for 60 minutes. And, we, and I have some examples here, and you will see this in the video as well. And I really target that vocabulary. Remember, a lot of what you're going to see, I feel, is like the product of all the planning and collaboration that we've done before the lesson. So b before the lesson, we talked and discussed what vocabulary we needed to make sure those students understood. And that's the vocabulary I made sure I pre-taught and built some background knowledge in there. And this one's on food webs and food chains. So with drama-based instruction, I made them act out a food web. And they became monkeys and you know, plants in the sun and all that. And they had a blast with it. Okay. All right, so um, before we start, let's go ahead and do our content objectives and our learning objectives. Okay, So what are we learning today, and how are we going to do that? All right, so our content objective, like what's our big what? What do we want to make sure we know before the end of this lesson is we will be able to construct a food web and explain how energy flows through multiple food chains. So raise your hand. What's a word in that content, content objective that you know that we've talked about? Mikkel. Food chains. Food chains. Can somebody remind our class what is a food chain? Jason? Basically what animals eat and what it turns into for the animals for they, so they can eat so they can have like energy and stuff. Okay, so definitely what they eat and how energy what, I, Elijah? Flow. High energy flows, that's key, good. Is there a word in this content objective that we haven't really talked about before? Maybe it sounds maybe familiar, but we haven't specifically talked about it. Chloe? Food web. Food web, good. That's a new vocabulary word that we are going to learn today, okay? So we will construct a food web and explain how energy flows through multiple food chains. That is our big what, okay? And how we're going to do that is we're going to look at a picture. And we're going to analyze it. Does anybody know what analyze means, maybe? Daniel, what do you think? To break it apart. To break it apart. Good. It means to break it apart, kind of break it down. Um, and then we're going to explain how all living things depend directly or indirectly on green plants for food. Um, and then we'll use pictures to create a food web. And then we're going to do an exit ticket at the end with some writing to show me and Ms. Pozo that you guys took um, what we learned today and are able to apply it with writing. OK, so we're going to. Um, look at a picture, we're going to watch a video, we're going to take some notes, do an activity, and then we're going to do our exit ticket. Okay, any questions about that? Director? Nope, we're good. Okay, so we're going to start with analyzing a picture, and it's uh, something that you guys have done before with Ms. Pozo. She's, she's going to lead you guys through that, okay? Do you want me to put the picture up? Okay. So remember when we had the picture and we, we labeled it and then we used the words and then you categorize the words and then you use the words to make sentences? OK, this is our print picture for this lesson. So we're just going to start labeling. So if you see something that you know, just raise your hand, all right? Carmina, what do you see? A tiger. So this is the tiger. Jose? You see the turkey. Thank you. Mm. You see snow. We have snow. 
What do you see? They're outside. They're outside, very good. Um, Hasiel? Rods. You see what? Rods. Oh, right here, yeah. See some rods. Okay, now I want you to start thinking some of those science words, okay? Caitlin? I see the tiger chasing the turkey. He's chasing the turkey, so what does that make him? What kind of animal is him? Ah. Okay, let's see. Right here. Hmm? Consumer. He's a consumer, yes. He's also something else. What, can, what else can we call him? He's a what? Primary consumer. Primary consumer? Hmm. Let's think about that one. Secondary. Secondary consumer, very good. What else is he? Daniel. He's a predator. He's a predator, very good. What does, if he's a predator, what does that make him? Oh. Emily. Prey, the poor turkey is a prey. <laughs> um, okay, more science words, anybody? Mm. The tiger's a carnivore. He's a carnivore, excellent. A carnivore eats what? Meat. <gasps> you can say it, meat. meat. Okay, so if he's a carnivore, what's the turkey? Anybody? Mm -hmm. And make sure that you can say it in a complete sentence. Isaiah? Um, I think that the turkey's an omnivore. He's an omnivore? Why is he an omnivore? Because I think a mixture of good. Very good. He's an omnivore. So we have a consumer. <gasps> yes? Turkey's a producer. He's a producer? A producer does what? Hold on to that thought. Makes its own food. Does the turkey make its own food? Oh, no. no, so not quite. But you're on the right track. Chloe? The turkey's a primary consumer. Do we have any, what do we need? What's the, yes, you agree on that, Caitlin, da, uh, Daniel? Um, photosynthesis. Okay, explain. Um, what are you trying to get at? How plants make their food. Plants make their own food, so plant is your what? <gasps> Producer. Producer, thank you. Do we see any plants here? Yes. Yes. What do we see? Trees. Trees. There's tons of trees. And they are your producers because they make their own food. Do you see what I'm getting at? Okay. Where? Yes. I know what you're trying to make. You're trying to make a food chain. Oh, I am. Explain that to me. So, I feel like, so, uh, so when we watched that video about how trees, like, basically make their own food, I think that what you're trying to do is like explain how the trees can help the tiger and how the trees can help the turkey or like like uh, make it in the right order so it can make sense so, so you can make a whole food chain. Excellent. All right. I think that's a great stopping point for this one. You guys got it. Okay. So what did you see? That was unbelievable. That was what? That was fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So she, she introduces with what, yes? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just, you, you said what did we see? I wanna know about the chips. Okay, okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, so she begins with the language and content objective, right? There's, there's your PSYOP. Talking chips is, is uh, something I learned at PSYOP training to help interactions and help our ELL students to also speak. If you notice Daniel in the back, he's one of our um, ELL kiddos. Next to him was um, Hasiel. He's the newcomer. He's the one that said rocks. And so the, I love the PWIM strategy because you know you can bring in your content vocabulary, but then there's so much more vocabulary that you wouldn't think that they would necessarily know or not know. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so you saw the talking chips, you saw the language objectives and the content objective. Ms. Uvar did a beautiful job at explaining the content objective and the language objective very well. And something that um, I've coached her into doing uh, in the beginning of her lesson is to make sure that 
she numbers off what we're going to do. We're going to look at a picture, we're going to analyze it, we're going to do an activity, we're going to do, and she did that, I think, about at least two times very thoroughly, <laughs> very explicitly, so the kids know exactly what they're about to do. So you, you've seen that and then the talking chips, and then um, the students, so obviously I had taught a lot of the vocabulary. I had done my own twin pictures, different pictures in the classroom with my ELL students to make sure that they knew what vocabulary they were going to encounter before we walked in there. Um, and so when Jason, you know, the aha moment, I love that moment because he knew, oh, I know what you're doing. So I said, okay, okay, I'm gonna stop right here so we can continue. The following day, we follow, we continue with the PWIM process. After that, they have to sort the words into categories that they come up with themselves. The following day, they use those words into sentences to create sentences. And then you can continue on the next day, then they could make a whole paragraph, maybe one or two paragraphs. It depends on how, what, you, what you want them to do. And then at the end, they title it. Well, eventually, I get to the point where I'm like, guys, that's like your main idea and all your details. And so, and we have that conversation. But that's a process, but you saw it up to that point. I wanted to make sure there was more for that to come as we continued our, our lessons. You're just getting that one lesson today. So our second video, uh, so this is where they watch a brain pop video. No, I'm not gonna make you watch a brain pop video. <laughs> But, and then so the strat, some of the uh, language supports were having that word bank there available for them to fill in a blank as part of their note taking. And then you're gonna see some discussion with their elbow partners. And I really like this part because that's when I get to walk around in Miss Uvard and listen to that language that's being used. So, and then now you'll get to see that part, go ahead. So what we're gonna do now is um, you glued those notes into your science journal, okay? And if you notice at the top um, of your notes, what do you see up there? What do you see at the top of your notes? Jason? Food chain. Um, the word food chain, but there's a list of words, so it's kind of like a what, Mikkel? Uh, 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 Carter's got it. What is it? Word bank. That's a word bank, okay? So we're gonna play a video, all right? And if you feel like you can use that word bank while we're watching the video to fill out your notes, I'll let you go ahead and try. Um, but then we're gonna come back together and we will fill them out together, okay? So you will have the correct notes by the end of um, us going through the notes. But if you wanna go ahead and try on your own, if you're like, ooh, I feel like I got this, here's a word bank, I already know this blank, go ahead and try it and try to push your learning. And even when you hear the video, if you hear something and you're like, oh yeah, I know what this is, you can do it. Um, but then we'll go over them together. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're gonna watch the video. And this video is gonna review kind of what a food chain is and it's also gonna introduce that new word that we're gonna talk about today called a food web, okay? All right, so what I want you to do is turn to your group, your little elbow partner, or no, you'll have to work with them, um, and share two things that you learned and one thing that the video said that you already knew. So two new things that you learned and one thing that you already knew that the video shared. Do that now with your partner. And the secondary consumer, and two things that I learned that one animal can change can change a whole food chain. All right, so Avery, tell me one thing that Jason said. What did your partner say? Mm-hmm. What do you like to eat? Uh -huh. Okay, so you're making a real world connection. You're a carnivore because you eat meat. Okay, cool. Isaiah, what's something that your partner said about the video? Well, Daniel said that that from the text that he, well, from the video, mm -hmm. he found out that organisms depend on each other to survive, which joins them together a food chain. Okay, in a food chain? Good. Jose, what's something that you guys talked about? Uh, Good. Predators eat their prey. Awesome. Caitlin, what's something you and Emily talked about? I said that, well, I knew that secondary consumers eat primary consumers. Okay, so you already knew that, and the video talked about that again. Good. Landon, what's something that you and Colin talked about? Um, we mentioned the same thing. Okay. Um, we said 
that um, we already knew that um, if the big animals eat their small animals mm -hmm. quickly, then they will die because they don't have anything to eat. Okay, so if that's an awesome connection, if all of their, if there's a lot of bigger animals, or let's call them secondary consumers, if they eat a lot of the um, primary consumers, Landon said the primary consumers could eventually maybe go extinct, which will affect the secondary consumers. They'll have nothing to what? Eat. eat. So what, do you, what could you infer? What will happen to them, Isaiah? So like a lot of animals will be dying. Yeah, a lot of animals could start dying. Good, and I like how some of y'all agreed. What's one more thing, MJ, that you guys talked about? I said that like a new thing that I learned is that the decomposers break down the thing with mm -hmm. the elements and then you can like reuse them to make stuff. Awesome, yes, and something new he learned. Decomposers can break down um, dead organisms and recycle their nutrients back into the soil. And who do you think that's probably good for in the soil? What's got, what uh, part of our food chains would that help, Daniel? Plants, right, because they use the soil's nutrients to help them grow. Awesome job. Okay, so what we're going to do is you might have already filled some of these notes out, but let's go through them together to make sure we have the, right, the correct answers, okay? And we're going to use our word bank up above to help us fill in these blanks, okay? So the first one says all living organisms linked together in a blank by what they blank. All right, Carmina, what do you think that first blank is? I think Okay, all living things are linked together in a food chain by what they blank. Close, but not exactly. Christopher? Food web? Not food web. Mm -mm. There's a word up there that goes there. Anybody think they know? Isaiah? Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Okay, so all living things are linked together in an ecosystem by what they, what, somebody, Elijah? Eat. By what they eat. Good. So make sure you have those two blanks filled in. All living things are linked together in an ecosystem by what they eat. Yes, thank you. All right, then our next one says, organisms depend on each other to survive, which joins them together in a what, Mikkel? Food chain. Food chain, good. Our next blank, disruptions in a food chain affects all organisms within a food chain. Food chains combine to form a what? What do we think they combine to form? Colin? A food web. A food web. So there's that new vocabulary word. So multiple food chains combine to form a food web. If you kind of think about like a spider web, you know how it has many different... Um, like little strings and stuff. So picture a food chain, but multiple food chains interconnecting create this giant food web, okay? Our next blank, food webs have three major components. Blank, blank, and blank. What do you think, Hasiel? Producers. Producers, good. Do you know all three? Uh -huh. Good. Producers, consumers, and decomposers. So those are the three major components that have to be inside a food web. Producers, consumers, and decomposers. Okay, our next one, producers are the blank part of any food web. So based off the words up here, what do you think that could be? Emily? Largest, largest. good. Producers are the largest part of any food web. Why do you think that might be? Why would producers be the largest part of any food web? MJ? Because they start the, the food chain. So they're, they're that major component that we have to have. They don't necessarily start the food chain, because what starts all food chains? Somebody raise your hand. Chloe? The sun. The sun. We have to have the sun. OK, but then the producers are that first component that receive energy from the sun to make their own what? Uh, to make their own food, right? But there's tons of plants. We have to have those plants in order for the food chain to even begin, for the primary consumers to eat, which allows the secondary consumers to eat. Good. All right, the next blank. Organisms that eat other organisms are called blank. Organisms that eat other organisms are called blank. Isaiah? Um, not decomposers, they eat other organisms. What eats? So consumer. consumer, good. Make sure if you have not used all your talking chips, like if you still have two, you want to be the person raising your hand. 
All right, and then our next one, um, or I'll finish reading that. It says, consumers cannot make their own food from sunlight, so they get their food from eating producers or other consumers. And then our last blank, blank breaks down dead animals and plants into reusable elements and recycle nutrients back into the food web. So what blank goes there? Jason? Decom you got it. Decomposers? Decomposers, good. All right, so in your own words, I want you to turn to your table partner and you can use your notes to tell them what a food web is based off what we just talked about. What is a food web in your own words? And you may use your notes because we just filled it in. Do that really fast. Like all of yours all can break down the parts, recycle all them, and then put like them back and mix it in together. And then, that's how they make like the and then, like, uh, producer, like, uh, soil and the sun and well, the rain, yeah. make up the uh, plant. All right, Elijah, what did Christopher say? What is a food web? A food web, he said, is what the, all food chains combine together and then he said it makes a food web. Shake it out if you agree. Good, so food webs are all of those food chains coming together to create a food web. And it, it's gonna show us how um, different organisms depend on each other and how they're all connected in some way. Colin? I don't really agree. Okay, well, what do you think? I don't, it's not every single, like, food chain. In the, are you talking about, like, in the whole world? Yeah. Yes, you're correct, yeah. It's just when some food chains come together. Exactly. Yes, exactly, good. Okay, so what did you see in this one? Could you tell who the ELL kiddos are? No, they were all participating. Exactly. And that's kind of our goal, you know? Um, we want them to participate. We, so this is the part where we wanted to talk about um, how the groupings, how we grouped our students. So Emily was with Caitlin. Emily is our EL kiddo. Um, we, for this particular lesson, I wanted that we had talked about this and because we're trying to get them to produce more language and speak more, we decided to pair them up with a monolingual student. So not with each other. It, only for the newcomer did he have a little extra help. But the other ones in the classroom were all paired up with a monolingual student. Emily was with Caitlin. Daniel was with Isaiah. Um, Carmina had a, a, her own other group. So they were all paired off that way, on purpose, because we wanted them to try and talk more with their peers and then to produce more. Like I was shocked that Hasiel raised his hand and said the three vocabulary words that, because that was his, and I gotta tell you his story real quick. This was his fourth day at our school. On day one, he was a runner. <laughs> We were originally going to record my lesson in my classroom, but I was too scared he would run. <laughs> so I said, no, let's just do this Uberars, because there's a lot of people and he'll, be, he'll feel more comfortable. So Haciel came from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico schools are very, very different. It's very open air. You know, lunch rooms are kind of almost outside because there's so many windows and everything's open. And he was scared because everything was closed. He kept telling me, why is everything so closed? Why aren't the doors open? Why is the cafeteria the way? And he would, so they would walk him in the morning and he'd end up crying on my side for a few minutes. And I'd console him and slowly walk him back down that way. But that was day four of him being there. After he figured out, okay, I'm safe. Nothing's gonna happen. I'm okay. Everything's good. So then he felt, and then when he saw that he had other friends in that classroom that could speak his language, that also helped bring it down. But he's such an anxious little boy to want to learn, so he's been very easily able to coax him to participate. So we're proud of Hasiel. Um, so video segment three, um, that's the big activity. And for this one, you're going to see, that's the yarn activity and the tickets out. When we talked about the activity, we wanted to make sure that, um, so Emily. Emily is, this is her second year here. All last year, the child was in her silent period. She wouldn't even speak to me in Spanish. Like, she was as quiet as a mouse. So all that time, I've been trying to get Emily to speak. So when you see the yarn activity, I purposely gave her the sun because she's the first, you know, she starts off the web. 
and to make her, you know, oh, I have an important role, let me say something. So you're gonna be able to see Emily and she just smiles and she, she feels so important because she got to be the son. And so, and then I, we, as I hand them out, you'll see, we, that was also very intentional. And that was part of you know, something we had discussed in our planning. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create our own food web, okay, as a class. So what I need you to do is you may leave your talking chips at your table, okay, at your seat. And if you will stand up and push in your chair, and I need you to form a giant circle right in our big area right here. So do that as quickly as possible. Um, so we're leaving our talking chips at our desk, so everyone is available is able to participate right now, even if you have zero talking chips, um, because I'm gonna let you participate, okay? If y'all will scoot this way a little bit, scoot this way, so everybody can get in, because Isaiah still needs to fit in, okay? All right, hey. All right, so Miss Pozo is going to give a few of you um, a little lanyard, okay? And what's on your lanyard is an organism. So you may be a plant, you may be a um, producer, or that is a, producers are plants. Um, you may be a consumer, you could be the sun, okay? So once you get one, I want you to put it on your neck, all right, and you don't play with these, just put it on your neck, and make sure your picture is faced um, forward, okay? Now, if you don't get one, it's okay, because there's not one for everyone, all right? So all you will do is just sit down, okay? So once Ms. Pozo has passed them all out, I just need you to have a seat if you don't get one. You still get to participate, though. Everyone's gonna participate and discuss and talk, okay? Um, but if you don't have one, I just need you to have a seat once she passes them all out. All right, make sure your um, organism is face forward. Okay, so we can all see it. All right, so let's go around, and if you can't exactly pronounce your um, organism's name, that's okay. All right, so, okay, let's start with you. What do you have? Um, <coughs> you have a hawk. What are you? Uh, consumer or producer? Producer. I mean, consumer. Consumer. What do you have? Rabbit. What are you? Consumer. Consumer. What are you? Pastor. What are you? A producer. What are you? I am a coyote. You're a coyote. What are you? Consumer. 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 You have a prairie dog. dog. What are you? I'm a clover and I have, and I'm a um, producer. Producer. I have a mouse. Mouse. And what are you? Consumer, very good. What are you, Jose? Res. And what are you? Consumer. Co are you a consumer? What are you? Uh, Cardinals. Who can help him out? If he's grass, he's what? Producer. 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 What are you? Metal work. Type of, type of bird. Type of bird. You're a consumer. I'm a consumer. You're a consumer. Very good, and you are? A snake, and I'm a consumer. Okay. Who has the sun? Right here. Oh, Emily, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Emily, where are you? The sun. What are you? So she helps everyone's, every single food chain, every single food web starts with the what? Sun. The sun. So we have to have the sun, correct? Okay. Um, and she's going to get to choose who her energy is going to flow to, okay? So if she's the sun, who could she choose for her energy to go to next? Carter? Producers. A producer, okay? So I want you, what producer, if you look around, who, Jason, turn yours around so we can see it. Make sure yours can be seen. Okay, so any of the producers in here you can choose to uh, give your energy to. Who do you want to give it to? Do you see a producer? Any of them? Noah. Okay, so give him the ball of yarn. Yes. There we go. Good. All right, and then Emily, you're going to hold on to this. So don't let go, okay, because you have to hold on to that. Okay, so her, the sun's energy went to Noah, and Noah's a producer, and he's called a sunflower, okay? Now, Noah, who might get energy from you? A consumer. A consumer. Now, what kind of consumer? Somebody else might get energy um, from him. Somebody, Mikkel? Uh, a primary consumer. So Noah, can you look around and find a primary consumer in here that could receive energy from you? Who might eat you? Landon. Landon. Landon is a grasshopper. Do we all agree a grasshopper might eat some plants? Good. So you'll hold on to your end and Landon gets the yarn. If I were to take away Landon, okay, what's going to happen to some of you? What's going to happen if I were to take away Landon? Kermina? Or the primary 
producer. Okay, so the primary consumer will not be able to eat. Can you elaborate on that more? So he's a grasshopper. So if I were to take him away, what's going to happen? Wait, nope, the grasshoppers produce their own food? No. no. Where do they get their food? From grass. From grass. They get their food from producers. So, but if I were to take Landon away, who is he giving energy to? <coughs> the other primary consumers okay so if he were gone what do you think would happen to those people what would happen Monique they might die, they might die because they don't have anything to eat or they're gonna have to go look for other things to eat okay Noah um the, the population of plants would be uh, grow too too much okay why do you think that go elaborate on that because there'll be nothing to eat the the grass and exactly. Good, so it goes both ways. If Landon were to die out of the ecosystem, not only would um, people who eat him be affected, but also, the, uh, Noah said that the population of the plants might grow because if he's not eating them, well then they're gonna increase, but whatever eats Landon is going to decrease. decrease. Good. Now what if the sun were to be totally taken out? Raise your hand. What's going to happen to everything in our ecosystem? Christian? Everything's going to die because we have to start with the what? Sun. We have to start with the sun. Good. Colin, do you have something to add? Like once the small one dies, it mm -hmm. just keeps on going up the side. The primary dies. And yes. then the secondary dies. Yes. And then the big one dies. Yes, yeah, so everything affects other, if something dies, it's not just going to affect itself, but it's going to affect all organisms within the ecosystem. Elijah? Yeah, um, if we didn't have the sun, because the sun has all the energy, mm -hmm. and then we need the sun for animals to have energy. Exactly. Well, we need the sun to give energy to the producers, which gives energy to the consumers. Yes. Good. Jason? Um, I have a couple things. Okay. I think if a, if a rabbit went away, mm -hmm. then I think the the prairie dog might die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, even though I know the snake eats the mouse, but like I feel like um, <coughs> the snake might eat a rabbit or something. They could, yeah. And I think I think the snakes might die, or like <coughs> yeah, the coyote, uh -huh. coyotes or something like yes. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like basically, if the, I I think the rat, rat rabbit is basically a really key thing because there's a lot of carnivores, mm -hmm. carnivores. If it was living within an ecosystem that had a lot of carnivores, yes, yeah. So I think that would be the really key thing to a, a carnivore, a uh, food rep or just a food chip. Good. Mikael? Uh, if the sun wouldn't give the plants the nutrients, um, the rabbit and the uh, mouse uh, would affect the secondary consumers. Exactly. Elijah, last thing. If we didn't have the sun, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have like a food chain or a food web. Exactly, we wouldn't have anything, right? So the big takeaway from this is all organisms depend on other organisms within a food web. There has to be all of those components like we talked about. There has to be a producer, there has to be a consumer, and then there needs to be decomposers that break down those dead organisms to recycle that nutrients back into the soil, okay? Um, and if one organism starts dying out, it's going to affect lots of things within the ecosystem, okay? All right, so what I want you to do is if you have string, I will come get it for you from you or Miss Pozo will. Um, and then you can just keep your lanyards on for right now. We are going to um, go ahead and do our exit ticket. So if you will return to your desk quietly and make sure you have a pencil out, okay? Return to your desk quietly and make sure you have a pencil out. All right, before we go to our exit ticket, let's just review um, everything that we just discussed, okay? Now up here we have some sentence stems. So I want you to use these sentence stems when answering my questions, okay? It helps you talk in a complete sentence and it helps you use the vocabulary that we were discussing today, okay? So when the activity that we just did, back table, make sure you're paying attention. The activity that we just did, what were we representing? What were we representing? Jason? What? How can you use a sentence stem? We are representing a food web. We were representing a food web. Awesome. Now, when we were representing that food web, what was what was in the food web? What what consisted of the food web? Chloe. Mm -hmm. Good. We. Yes, we had to have a producer. We had to have a consumer, and we had to have a decomposer. Now, who can tell me what is a food chain? Um, Elijah, what is a food chain? A food chain is where there's energy that goes one place and then it flows. Not one place, from one. 
Somebody help them out. One what? Carmina? Organism. It flows from one organism to another. The energy flows from one organism to another. Good. Isaiah? Like a food chain is kind of like how the energy flows from another organism, another organism to another. Good. Using, Good. Like with a producer, a consumer, a primary consumer, mm -hmm. and a secondary consumer. Using all those components. Now, how are food chains and food webs connected? How are they connected? How are they related? How are food chains and food webs related? Somebody, MJ, what do you think? They're related kind of like they, they each show which organism goes like to the next, like how energy flows. Okay, they both show how energy flows. What else? How else are they related? How else are they related? How are food chains and food webs related? Somebody that hasn't been participating. Noah. They both all have consumers. They both all have producers. And they both have omnivores and herbs. Yes. They both have those components. Do we need food chains to create a food web? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Because multiple food chains. Good. Multiple food chains make a food web. Good. Daniel. And a um, food chain is different than a food web. It, a food web is different because it is um, more than one food chain. Awesome. A food web is different than a food chain because a food chain just has those producer, consumer, decomposer. But a food web has multiple, right? Because it's multiple food chains that make a food web. All right. Awesome job. So I know that was really long, but that was like the big, you know, um, part of the lesson. And so you saw how we gave out the labels and we picked out those kids on purpose. I know Emily's back was to the camera, but if you could have seen her face, you would have seen that big old smile because she got to be the sun. And um, the camera, I know they were trying to capture what a lot of the kids were saying, but did you notice I'm in the back with the, with the kids? They were having a lot of um, conversations about, and I, was, I would say, refer to the sentence stem, say that in a complete sentence. I'm trying to get them to use it all. Those sentence stems, we had planned for them. You know, during our planning time, we said, okay, how do we want them to speak? And so we came up with those sentence stems. We try not to overdo it because then it kind of like gets lost in the shuffle. But if we focus on just a few and make sure that they use it, then they're actually using that language. Um, the ticket out is the writing portion. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but can, can you easily see there's language, there's the listening, speaking, reading, and writing all right there within the lesson. Um, so the last part of the cycle, you know, all of this was lesson del delivery. So going back to that cycle, the last part, the next part is a debriefing where we assess were we successful or not? And if so, you know, what's our next step? So the next, um, the last video segment is uh, Ms. Uverard and I debriefing the lesson. Hello, my name is Isol Marie Pozo. I am the ESL teacher here at Scales, and this is my partner. Um, I'm Jessica Uverard. I'm a fourth grade teacher here at Scales. So um, at Scales, we've had a huge um, increase in ESL students, and so we saw the need to come into the classrooms more than pull out. Well, for part of that process, I thought that, you know, an, to cover that need that we would need to help the classroom teachers with some more ESL strategies. So I started working co-teaching with um, Jessica. She's been kind enough to let me in her classroom and it's been awesome because she has a big number of our kiddos. She has three tra transitional students um, and she has three, um, well actually four newcomers that come in. They are at a, a WIDA composite level of a one and Daniel is a 2.3 I think and so um, my job is to come in and help her build language supports into her lessons. We've, you saw us using, or you will see us using, the talking chips, um, sentence stems, word banks, and using a purposeful partnership with um, the gen ed classroom students. So Jessica, I thought that today's lesson went great. Um, you started with the content and language objectives. I think they were right spot on, and um, the kids understood exactly what we were about to do mm -hmm. and how they were going to do that. Yeah. Um, 
and I love their interaction with, with the kids and the fact that they knew what analyze meant, uh -huh. breaking things down apart. Yeah. And then um, with the Pwim picture, mm -hmm. the, the Pwim picture I really think really just was a really good way to start it off. And I love that they made that connection from last week. Mm -hmm. Remember last week we talked a lot about, you know, the plants and f making their own food and photosynthesis mm -hmm. and that the sun begins all the, the whole energy process. So what, what did you think about the Pwim picture? The, it, it like kicked it off. And when Jason made that connection, it was like, made everything come together. Like, oh, this is why we're doing this. And this makes sense. And this is what it's leading into. So, yes, I thought that yeah. was a perfect segue into the next part. Mm -hmm. um, brain pop video. Yeah. They're just, I never heard them, well, not never, but they are like discussion, like as far as like sharing stuff about the video, like I let it go longer than I even thought because like when I was walking around and like listening to them, they were still on task talking, like they were like, I could tell they had been engaged in the video because they had so much to say. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. And I liked how we, we tried this grouping with Caitlin and Emily mm -hmm. and then Isaiah and the boys. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was helping the boys because they are, you know, their WIDA level composite is, is a one and Hazel's mm -hmm. newcomer. So that's why I was trying to help them more. Yeah. But um, Caitlin and Emily did great. I was going to say, how did. So that was us debriefing, and we went through the whole lesson. And then there's a part where we're like, okay, you know, um, we'll, could, we'll start here. You know, we, we decided to begin the next day with their ticket out. So we. We, look at the, we looked at their tickets out and what they wrote, their sentences, how they wrote them. And um, we saw that there was, um, there was still a little bit of confusion as to a food web is multiple food chains together. So it was like, okay, we will begin here the next day. And so that's the whole process. And then, so um, for purposes of this training, that's where we had stopped. But once the cameras were gone, you know, her and I just continued, you know, okay, the next day, and here's what we're going to do. And then after that, we went into doing social studies. And I know in these videos, um, Ms. Uvard is primarily the one teaching. On the next go-around, I led the class in a um, role-playing. It's called Mantle of the Experts. So the students had to become Sacagawea and Lewis and Clark, and I was a lost person who needed help. And so we grouped them again and make sure that the EL students had the proper support in each of the groups. And here comes a little person, lost me, and I, they had, I said, you gotta give me advice, how am I gonna get out of here? And they had to tell me. But they had to read about their person, they had sentence stems to help them answer me what they were gonna say, and so on and so forth. This process is a continuous thing, you know, we, we, go, we get through a whole unit, get it done, and then we go do it again, and then we do it again. We're not experts by all means, um, but we have been trying it. Um, I do feel that it's been very, very beneficial for our EL students and the other classroom kiddos that are in there. Um, the way they treat each other, there's a more sensitivity to the EL students, especially when Haciel came in and you know, he would cry or he wanted to leave the classroom. And so we had those conversations with, with the other students. So your turn to discuss with your elbow partner. What did you see that you could use in your classroom? How would this work at your campus? And who can you bring to the table to talk about resources or support needed for implementing some co-teaching models in your school? Would help, um, just so they're seeing those words. The team is like, you know, you want to get a vigorous, like, you know, instruction. I think if you have a better situation, you should be to see your kids all day. I only get to see mine for, uh, like, 45. Mm -hmm. Because I go to three different schools, and I have elementary and middle school. Mm -hmm. They had a really good question for me. They said, what do you do if the kids are not using their talking chips? So that's something you didn't get to see in the videos, but Ms. Uberard and I will say, you know, we watch the time, we're like, okay, we've noticed a lot of you still have talking chips. You need to use your talking chips. And, and so that's one way we, we try to manage it. Or I will go around and walk and I'll stand next to someone that hasn't used any of them and I kind of go, you know, <laughs> and point it out for her. That's another uh, thing that, that we've done. But I had another really good question here. Um, did they also have a fourth grade that's pretty heavy and how do you get the teacher to, to do this? Remember that slide about essential elements? Building relationships with the classroom teachers, I know it's not easy, but it's, it's so important. 
And I've tried really hard to do it in subtle ways, you know. I knew she was apprehensive at first for me to come in. I, I didn't understand that, so I made sure I was like, I'm not here to judge you, I just want to help. And so I slowly, you know, got in there. And then once she had my trust, for example, the talking chips, all I did, you know, I don't go in there and say, hey, we're going to do this. This is what we got to do. I don't do that. I said to her, hey, did you notice that the ELL kids are not talking a whole lot? You know, Emily's really quiet. And she goes, yeah, I know. What can we do? I was like, I got it. It's called talking chips. You know, I did things like that. And that's how slowly, little by little, that relationship has grown. Um, my advice to you is, like I said, you really got to want to try this because it takes a lot on your part to go out of your way to build those relationships with the classroom teachers. Bring down their inhibitions by making them feel safe. You're not there to evaluate them. You're there to help. I always tell her, I'm a resource, I'm a tool, use me. And I see it this way too. I've, I've taught bilingual kid, kiddos a long time. And I, and I love what I do and I am passionate about it because I was them. I am still them. I look at them and I see myself in these kiddos. And I think back, man, if someone would have done this or that or the other. You know, I was a statistic. I was supposed to be, you know, right back on that list of people who need a lot of assistance, which is not a bad thing, but still, you want to get out of that cycle, right? So I see this as a opportunity to not just co-teach with her, but coach her in PSYOP. And any strategy that I have used that may have helped me, because once I'm gone, guess what? She'll be able to do it without me. And that's what I want. I want to be able to impact teachers in different classrooms, because as much as I love my babies, I can't be in every single classroom with them. As much as I want to be, God, if I could, if I could figure that way to clone myself like that, I would, hands down. But I can't, so what's the next best thing? Train them. So that's why I've gotten into this journey. I do want to say um, there have been some success. We've been successful. Before Ms. Uvarard, I worked at a different school. And I worked with Ms. Hadley. She's over there. And I'm going to point her out because Ms. Hadley was a classroom teacher. And I was able to push in with her and co-teach and teach her some of the PSYOP model. She's an ESL teacher now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, those are my. Um, two bits and so here's the takeaways. You gotta have the essential elements. That's like, you've got to start there. You've got to start building those relationships with the classroom teachers. You can, there's several models. You don't have to be stuck on one. In fact, best practice says you don't do that. You try different multiple things. Um, it's beneficial for all of the kiddos in there. And last one, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to walk into someone's classroom and say, hey, I, I really want to work with you. And that's kind of how I approached her. I was like, I really want to work with you. I've heard you're great. You know, you, what they say in a, a parent-teacher conference, you butter them up and you give them all the good and then you slide it in there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I kind of what I did. Um, and the last slide is just an addition, some additional resources. Another way that, um, that we're able to plan and collaborate, we both use Planbook EDU. And she shared her plan book with me. And I think I've shared mine with her and so we can see each other's plan book. And that's another thing that facilitates planning. On Google Drive, uh, you saw the slide with the content and language objectives. So we've shared that and I can go ahead and make the content and language objectives for her. And I, I don't have to be sitting next to her. I could be doing that. I do it by choice. I could be doing that at home. But since it's, you know, it's on, online, then that's another easy way to facilitate collaboration. Um, Drama-based instruction, and I put the website there because as an ELL kid, and I don't know if you noticed, but I kind of like acting a lot. <laughs> and because when I was a child, guess who I learned most English from? The teachers that could really connect with me and make me laugh and feel, make me feel good. So drama-based instruction, um, amazing stuff. If you've never been, uh, Tennessee Arts Academy also does an amazing summer professional development. And that's where I've learned a lot of this, th these things. And I put this picture here of um, same um, people that do this high up stuff have done one for math. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I will be around. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, you have a question.
but it's for her. As a, as a new teacher, so this was your second year to teach. How did you, how do you feel you've grown as a teacher having her in your classroom? Yeah, um, all the things that she like brings to my classroom is amazing. Uh, just like the, the, the ELL strategies, is like this is what we could use to help with the ELL students, have helped with my just normal students as well, like especially the talking chips. Not only are my ELL students quiet, but I, you also just have those other quiet students, and so that's brought them out of their shell. Um, and she brings like, you know, like when you're a teacher and you don't know how to explain something, but you're just stuck because no one else is there. So I'll like rely on Ms. Pozo to, hey, can you explain this another way? Or can you draw a model? Or can you do whatever? And she always has something different to explain or a, another way to say it. And so it's even cool just to have her in there because when we co-teach, it's like we feed off one another. Um, and when I can't explain it the way, the kids need me to, like she's able to just jump in and it's cool when we feed off of each other like that. And so I've definitely learned so many strategies that not only help our ELL students, but also help just my normal students. I mean, they've grown, and like when Ms. Pozo's not there, they're like, oh, where's Ms. Pozo? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, it's just me. <laughs> um, so they've like grown to like expect her to be there and like rely on her. Um, and just the diversity it brings to the room too, just having, um, I don't know, I just like love hearing like a different language being spoken in my room and then the kids being exposed to that and like getting to see a student like um, Haciel who just came from Puerto Rico and like them seeing him kind of come out of his shell or seeing, they get so excited. Um, I try to tell them not to treat Emily like she's like this baby, but they, they're just kids, so they're trying to like learn how to adapt to it. But when she speaks, they get so excited. And um, it's just so sweet to see, and I'm like, okay, she's not a baby, but yeah, we can get excited when she speaks. Um, so it's cool for them, they'll be like, I just heard Emily say something. Um, and so uh, when she first was here, like she wasn't talking at all, um, at least in my classroom, but I think like having Miss Pozo in the class and, and other students who are ELL students, like being there with her, it's brought her out of her shell for sure. And I don't think she would be where she is today if it wasn't for that. So, so many benefits for me as a teacher and my students. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have a question about uh, your scheduling. Um, so like, I mean, it's amazing because you're able to have the time when you're pulling them out and then also time when you're Push, pushing into the classroom and then time to plan together. So uh, could you speak to that for a minute about maybe your caseload? I mean, a lot of us, I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but like, you know, I travel between schools and I have multiple, you know, these two different caseloads that I'm actually three. Um, but, you know, I'm just curious about what you have to say. That's that. a good question. And the ladies behind you had asked about that as well. So, yes, I don't spend my whole day just in fourth grade. I have a fifth and sixth class that I do their 60 minutes, then my fourth graders come in and I walk with her. I also do third grade and a kinder class. They're all pull out. This is the only class I get to push in. Um, the, uh, I am also, um, we have the benefit of having two other T ESL teachers that are back there. Say hi, Jessica and Kate. And they also, you know, when I'm pushing in, they're teaching first grade or second grade. So between the three of us, we're able to you know, service all of our students and pr give everybody what they need. Um, like I said, it's flexible scheduling. You know, if if Miss Johnson wouldn't have my principal wouldn't approve of that, or if they weren't, you know, able to pick up for that hour, I don't. I wouldn't have been, been able to do it. It's just when I saw the possibility on the schedule, I jumped on it. But it depends on your, it does, it does depend on, on your schedule and what kinds of supports you have in place that would allow you to do that. Thank you for your question. Yes? Just out of curiosity, how uh, heavy is your load at that one school? How many ESL students do you have? In all, we have Just ELLs. Total caseload, I think it's like 102, but direct serve are 66, 67. And then the other ones are our monitor students and WAVE students. So the amount of paperwork is insane. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, like I said, I do this because I want to. You know, it, it takes a lot of my own time. Nobody's obligating me, nobody pushes me. I don't have anybody down my throat. I do it because I want to. So if I have to plan outside of school, by golly, I do it. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Yes. Yeah, I have one for um, Jessica. Kind of similar to what Dr. Tennyson asked you earlier is, if Mrs. Uh, Polzo weren't not in your building, and by the way, we have a part-time position opening up next week in our district, <laughs> just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> but if you, if let's say circumstances change, let's, and w you wouldn't be able to do exactly what we saw in the video there, which was, which was great, but as, a, as the teacher driving the content, what specifically do you think you would still be able to continue with these kids that you might not have otherwise had you not been able to work with her on that? Yeah, I think like the biggest thing I've learned from her that's easy to like is that what you mean easy to implement on my own um, is just making sure I give them like multiple ways to access the content. So making sure I'm not just um, like we're not just taking notes. And that's all we do for the lesson, but giving them a visual, giving them some type of note taking or something to write down so they're also writing and then also discussion. So using speaking, listening and writing, like implementing those into every lesson, because I know that's something that she was like, that's big that you have to do for the ELL students. And I feel like that's just pr like that's what every teacher should do just in every lesson, whether there's ELL students or not. Um, yeah. So just kind of following up on that real quick then, um, how far into your collaboration working together would you say you could have maybe picked up on some of that? So if, she, if you hadn't set this up to do a co-teaching, but she was in there just to show you some things, would it have been, um, if you had done this straight for like a week, for example, would that have been enough or a couple of weeks or the full quarter? I'm just trying to get a perspective because we probably can't do a co-teaching like that in most of our schools. However, if we could dedicate and say, you're gonna be in that person's room for a week, and we'll set other things aside, would that have been enough for you? Okay, so like train, like how long would they need to be like trained necessarily? Right, and, and she's not gonna be there. She's not gotcha. going to, I mean, she'll yeah. be in your building, but she won't be doing what you were just yeah. doing there, right? I mean, I feel like two weeks, or like her just being able to model and teach right. me things. kind of what you were doing there, but she's gonna step back from that. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think it would take super long um, for me to just learn, see her, do, like the um, poem, I got to see her do that before I ever, I ever did it by myself. Um, so okay. I don't think it would be like a month or anything. Yeah, right. Right. depending on, I guess, how much you're wanting to teach them and right. how much you want to implement, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a good thought. I mean, when you think about coaching, two, maybe three at the top, at the most, where I could give a person a lot of these tools and then let them go on their own, <coughs> yeah, I think I could accomplish that. And it also depends on their willingness. Well, yeah. She was super open to all of it. <laughs> You know, not once did she, was she like, Ugh, you're crazy, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> not once, she would be like, oh God, that sounds cool, how do you do it? You know, when you find someone like that, yeah, two weeks, maybe three, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, absolutely. That's a good idea. I think, I think you would have to look at it too where you would wanna come back and revisit maybe to teach a chunk of something. Come, you know, and then then come away, and then you'd probably want to come do observations with that. I think that to coach and then not observe afterwards is, and if you've probably been a coach as well, and I think that's important. But I think that's a really great idea for those people that have different resource resources and stuff. Maybe just one one thing at a time, like maybe just the poem, yeah. and, and and then get that down really good, yeah. and then come back in with one more thing. <laughs> Any other questions? What does PWIM stand for? Picture Word Induction Model. Um, at the collaborative, Ms. Um, Dr. Clark, sorry, Dr. Clark has brought in uh, Ms. Bontempi, and I learned it from her and one of my coworkers too. She um, had previously done it, so she taught me as well. Any other questions? This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're done. I have a question, please. Ms. Uverard? Oh, yes. Yeah. Talk to us about if we have teachers who simply don't want to co-teach. Just say, I'm doing my thing. I really don't want to do, try this. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, being a new teacher, it's, oh, from my perspective, I feel like it's easy to be really open because I feel like I don't know anything, <laughs> so, um, so it's really easy to be open because hearing like any teacher in my building, like if they have been teaching for years and years and um, they wanna come to my classroom and help me out, I'm like, uh, yes, please. <laughs> um, so I think for those teachers who are very closed off, um, I get it, because if you've been teaching a while, you feel confident, you feel like you know what you're doing and you get into a routine, um, but you just have to be open, knowing that you don't know everything um, 
and that you need to give some things a try because like when Miss Pozo does tell me some things she wants to try, like the drama based thing, um, I was like, yeah, let's do it. But I was a little nervous because I was like, how are they going to act out? And like, but like when you just try something and it fails, I mean, that happens every day in the classroom. So just let it happen because it's not going to ruin your whole year. You know, just try things. And when we tried it, it was so amazing. Like yes, it right. was incredible. That's what I wanted to say. When we actually did try and she let me actually do it, you know, she, we, she was scared the kids were going to get all off test. But no, they, they behaved so beautifully. They were so engaged. I had them at the palm of my hand. It was awesome. Thank you so much for presenting today and 